listeners, one of us did not watch the debate. You'll have to guess who it was. We're all going to, though, act as though everyone watched the debate. Wait, is that true? Hello and welcome to this late night debate reaction edition of the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk, the first and only vice presidential debate between Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris just wrapped up. It was a far more civil and coherent debate than the first presidential debate, but it left a lot to be desired in terms of straight answers. The candidates discussed the COVID-19 pandemic, the economy, climate change, foreign policy, the Supreme Court and the legitimacy of the election, amongst other things. A fly also made an appearance on Mike Pence's head, and also apparently there was a dog barking. I don't know if it was in the actual auditorium or outside, but you could definitely hear a dog barking. Anyway, here with me to break it all down, our editor-in-chief, Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Hey, Galen. Also here with us is senior politics writer Claire Malone. Hey, Claire. Hey, Galen. And managing editor Micah Cohen. How's it going? Hi, Galen. Hi, everybody. Nate, you welcomed Galen like you weren't sure it was actually him. Like, hey, Well, he wasn't Galen. sure if I had watched the debate. In virtual times like these, how do we know when they are real? I haven't that's, seen that's any of I, you in person in six months. Well, you can come over. Maybe yeah, I just checked in recently to make sure Claire was real. Claire is still real, as is Tony. I'm not sure if Micah and Nate are real, though. We can hang out, socially distant. All right, well, let's get to the actual debate, Nate. And let's start with you. It was a very different debate from the first presidential debate. What did you make of it? I, I have like six or seven reactions, none of which are particularly coherent. Or they're perfectly coherent, but they don't necessarily tell a big narrative, right? Um, one reaction is it's going to fire up partisans on both sides, and therefore will not make any difference, right? Reaction number two is I think they're going to have maybe a very gendered um, critique and response to the debate, right? Response number three is, hey, actually, the only thing that mattered was Mike Pence, again, kind of refusing to commit to the results of the election, or at least obfuscating. Answer number four is, like, the theme of the debate was obfuscation, a little bit more from Pence than from Harris, but, like, there was not a lot of follow-up or follow-through, Um Reaction number five is all people will remember um, is uh, the fly on Mike Pence's beautiful white head of hair for two full minutes. And reaction number six is um, kind of answer number one B, right? The debate won't matter unless somebody had COVID <laughs> at the debate. You probably should not have had this debate. Mike Pence should probably have been quarantining. He had close contact with a lot of people who have COVID less than 14 days ago. Um, so that's the way in which the debate could definitely matter. All right, like well, you actually had six responses. I, I thought you that was a hyperbole, but uh, Claire, what no, did you make of I it? used up was, all the hot Was things. one of those six more, more relevant than the others? It was like a parable of, uh, it was like the other half of a parable about debates. Like if the first, if the presidential debate was um, loud and noisy and as a viewer, you knew you weren't getting any straight answers, this one was characterized by polite, sophisticated, you're not getting any answers, which I actually think is the more pernicious kind of debate. And I was, um, I found myself being sort of quietly inth infuriated throughout the um, hour and a half by the lack of follow-up by Susan Page, who was the moderator. Obviously being a moderator, you know, like being a bridesmaid is a thankless job, and I'm sure you probably feel compelled to do it if asked. Um, but it was just like really infuriating, particularly, I have to say, um, the penultimate question where Paige asked Pence, you know, will you uh, make sure that there is, if you know, if you lose, that there is a peaceful transfer of power, that the president accepts the election results. And Mike Pence flat out didn't answer the question at all. And then Susan Page moved on to a question from an eighth grader. Listen, I appreciate civics as much as the next person, but I don't give a shit what the eighth grader's question is. I want to know what Mike P Pence's answer to that question was. And I thought it was a true failure. And I'm, I'm kind of... Um, uh, you know, my blood is a little bit boiling about it. I just, I just, um, yeah. and I, and I feel like 
people are lulled by the sense of calm and oh these are two adults debating and isn't it nice they were nice to each other you didn't get any information out of them particularly pence and pence also didn't answer the question about um what if the president becomes disabled which seems well neither did harris to be clear okay but when one of them has a one of them has a president is the vice president right now with a president who i mean again let's just kind of look at statistical likelihoods, right? The indications are the president has at least moderate, if not severe COVID based on the drugs that are prescribed people with moderate to severe COVID. I listened to your all's episode on Monday with Dr. Spencer. Um, You know, uh, someone being prescribed those medications and with severe COVID can have some risk of um, having to be put on a ventilator, some risk of dying, can also have brain fog and other complications, right? Uh, is the president behaving entirely normally? It's hard to say. For most presidents, we'd say no. Okay, um, I totally so, understand yeah. that, Nate. But also, given that they're both septuagenarians, Biden would be the oldest candidate to ever take office if he were to be inaugurated in January at 78 years old. It just seems like a question that both of the parties should have answered. Um, but, Michael, let's get you in here. Yeah, it was it was a reminder, I think, as Claire said, that like normal politics, quote unquote, pre Trump normal politics, quote unquote, is like and has always been uh, has always been is a very, very empty, uh, you know, activity. Um, You know, Trump does a lot of unusual things, which which draw attention to how meaningless most of what happens in the political world is um but it's still meaningless even if trump isn't doing those those really crazy things i thought it's a again like let's put aside what do you mean by meaningless or empty i mean almost everything that both candidates said um, was pablum was was rehearsed you know is there 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 are big truths behind it all which is to say genuinely both parties have very 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 different approaches to to government and to public policy um so that's a big truth right but that doesn't change day to day and day to day we have all these things including debates that that are just like noise um and as claire was saying tonight we got the the like low level noise um the more normal noise but it's still just noise and it's it's we didn't get any any sort of newsworthy answers to any any questions. And I don't think we'll get any in the other debates. Anything that makes news will more likely be some gaffe or some some break of a, of a norm. Right. It's it's these things are are not full of meaning they're just not or value, you know, like literally what's trending. What's trending on my Twitter column right now is. Trump campaign says it's saving a VP debate ticket for Tupac, the fly, and like pink eye for Pence. Those are the things that are trending. And I, and I, and it's not, I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny. But it, it's like, it, it's, 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 it's revelatory of just like the true, what, I, well, don't get me too deep. But like, <laughs> this is, this is like, um, it was pretty maddening, and there there were parts of it that I think they obviously got into um, some substantive discussions, and there were some things that I wish had been like an actual interesting debate. Um, there are, there are some things that I think Harris didn't answer that people probably want to know more on fracking, SCOTUS, you know, court packing stuff, Green New Deal stuff. Um, but it was just like. It's October. So I guess if the wild and crazy, constantly interrupting version of the debate and the more mellow, question evading version of the debate both seem somewhat like failures in terms of educating the American public about their choices, should we just not have debates? Is there a way to do this in a constructive way? None of these people, these people are all too afraid to actually say a thing that they're thinking. This goes like, you know, I can't remember who said it on our live blog, but they were like, oh, well, I guess it's interesting to see like what their prepared talking points are. No, it's not. Like it's, it's, um, it's actually damage. 
it's actually damaging that we've been conditioned to think that way. And it's damaging that our post game, you know, show about all this stuff is like, um, theater criticism about it, whichever it's which his own kind of trite thing. Um, but I think, you know, would the, like, What's a, what's a way to redo the form where we know that these people are, are public figures and are always going to be careful with their words? What's a revelatory way to get them to ask questions? I mean, to answer questions. Um, I'm not sure, but I, I think like the format of like, you know, oh, the bald eagle is sprawled across the stage. It's, now we know it's time for an hour and a half of talking points. I mean, I don't know, but I think, you know, like so many things, we're all starting to question the... Uh, the undergirding structures that we've all sort of taken as the the scenery. Nate? I mean, Harris Harris also made some conservative tactical choices, right? Um, she stuck to pre-scripted, often well-scripted and effective, but remarks that felt pre-scripted rather than reacting to Pence's answers, um, which if you're now nine and a half points ahead in polls... Um, is maybe a good risk averse choice, but she is a good debater, um, not without risk, but you know, but she could have pushed back more directly at Pence and and kind of elected not to. Um, and we've seen her again be very prosecutorial and effective in many of the Democratic debates. So I think that was a choice on her part. It's not like she's someone who um, struggles to think on her feet. I remember we we've had this discussion before, by the way, and I think we landed on it should be a dinner party format. Do you remember this? Right. Yeah. It should oh, either yeah. be what, our things was or or that they should completely have no moderator and that you should just let the two people like self moderate. That they discuss what they want to discuss. They handle themselves how they want to handle it. And it's about like, does someone help the other person with the dishes? Like that's much more revelatory, I think, than than what we watch tonight. But let yeah. me let me give you kind of a more a more a less like nihilistic reaction. Um, you know, th- this campaign has been long, and I think we're all we're all tired. Um, oh, it's not. By the way, it, no, but don't. I, I want you to have your reaction. But like, my nihilism is not just because it's October and I'm tired. To clear, to be clear, no. I first of all, I share your nihilism, um, and no, it's well founded. Um, I think, uh, I think, at least for me, it comes out more uh, when it's October and I'm tired. Um, but, but two thoughts, and I'm curious what you guys think of them. One is, um, you see just how hard it is, just how hard the substance is for the for the Trump Pence campaign on COVID. The the first section of the debate on on the substance, like putting aside the the tactics of of either candidate, are, are just brutal sort of rhetorically um, and politically, and obviously in, in the real world. Um, that's what makes it so brutal. And but the other thought I had is that you I think one thing I was thinking tonight is like, I think you see how ineffective Trump is as a politician in these moments by how effective Pence was in just being sort of like generic Republican. Um, Right. Saying the thing you need to say as a politician. Yeah. We're like, why are you presuming that's effective? Well, I, so I am. uh, Maybe people recognize it as a lie, but it seems smarmier. And at least Trump is kind of taking the piss. Well, Trump is losing by nine and a half points, so that's not effective. But you're right that I I am presuming that that this is m- more effective. But I don't know if it's if it's true. It's why it's why I said I'm curious what you guys think. But just like to to say it generally and then give an example, there are moments in the debate where I where it remind me actually a lot of the of the 2016 debates in their more normal moments, and even of like the 2012 and and 2004 debates. Um, and being, you know, the moments about kind of abortion or, or climate change. And Pence was Pence was fighting points, at least on subjects in which public opinion is closer to 50 50 or 55 45 against them or 60 40 against them. Trump fights these battles on these points where public opinion 
is 60-40 against him, 70-30 against him. It's just like basic politics 101. In particular, I thought, and this is an example of that, but like Pence's answer on COVID was what I expected to hear from Trump in the first debate, which is like, there's no good answer for their response on COVID. But what Pence said was, we trust the American people. We believe in small government. We're, we're not going to tell people what to do, which at least is like, that's, that's Republican ideology. You know, it's, a, it's at least a coherent um, philosophy, whatever you, how, whatever you think of its, of its merits in this moment. Um, and that it just seemed like much more effective to me as a strategy than, than what we saw from Trump. But maybe I'm wrong. Micah brought up the question of whether or not Mike Pence's approach to the debate and some of the more challenging policy questions was more effective than than when Trump took the stage in the first debate and as he litigates all of these things on Twitter on a regular basis. Does anybody want to agree or disagree with Micah? I don't know. I mean, there's just kind of a common take that, oh, if, if Trump were more charismatic, right? I mean, I think Trump is actually kind of charismatic. I think he's not good at politics, which are different things. You know what I mean? I think Trump makes lots of bad tactical and strategic choices. I think he um, creates problems for himself all the time, right? Um, and he's not like classically eloquent, right? But he has a certain shtick that works, right? Um, Don't we all? And his delivery yeah. in front of a crowd isn't bad. It's sometimes pretty effective. But um, it's exactly his the way he conducts himself personally that pulls so badly when you break it down for Americans, right? It's precisely that reason that his favorability numbers are significantly lower than his approval ratings or on personal characteristics like honesty or leadership. He pulls so much worse than things like the economy, for example, right? I mean, if you could boost those characteristics, we're not talking that about favorability. Galen, Galen, we're not talking about personal characteristics. We're talking about how they come across, Right. People their love an antihero, as HBO has told us. <laughs> People love an antihero. Their, their manner of speaking is literally what we're talking about. And I'm saying that is not a department where Trump is particularly deficient. I mean, maybe he is, right? But like, Did you but see he's the got first a certain debate? panache that... I don't think the lack of a calm, reassuring tone has much to do with Trump's lack of favorability rating, right? It may have to do that on COVID, where you can just kind of say reassuring things that seems to help a lot, like Governor Cuomo or something, right? Um, but, you know, apart from that, I'm not sure that that's the biggest issue with Trump. So, well, one, that wasn't really what I was saying. Um, I, I think I actually was saying what, what Nate, you you said in disagreeing with me, which which was that, like, Trump is bad at the tactics of politics. Like, it's so, okay. He, first of all, I do think these moments when he... He is manic and all over the place. Polls show the the public doesn't like that, right? Um, but put that aside for a second. The the he has the Trump campaign has a buffet of issues on which it can wage this campaign. Some are horrible for them in terms of public opinion and politics. Some are good for them. Um, some are some mixture of both. Trump consistently chooses the worst options. It's like the person who goes to the buffet um, and there's like steak and shrimp and, you know, they load their plate up with, I don't know, like string beans or potatoes, right? Like go for the good <laughs> stuff. Um, the- right. Like, for example, why wage this campaign on whether or not you should wear a mask when the polling is absolutely clear? Anyway, we mentioned early on that a theme of the night was evading questions. Um both did it pretty boldly um, at certain times. Perhaps Pence did it more than Harris, but there are certainly examples of both. Claire, I'm curious, the main kind of point where Pence was trying to get Harris to take a position and Harris wouldn't was on Supreme Court packing. Why was she so insistent on not answering that question? Because it's. I think people are scared by the idea of changing a branch of government, or at least politicians perceive that people are scared of that. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question that'll come under sharper scrutiny, closer scrutiny, if the Democrats win the White House and the Senate. And I mean, you know, 
it ain't over till the fat lady sings, but like, you know, as, as someone earlier in this podcast pointed out, Biden is in a decent position right now. And like, it's not a crazy thought that the Democrats could be in sort of full control, not sort of, be in full control of government. And they, because of the heightened partisanship of our times, they could feel increased pressure to make more radical policy shifts during, you know, the couple of years that they have a a guaranteed grip on power. And while I don't think Biden is temperamentally the kind of person who would want to pack the court, he's also a person who might get pushed into doing just that. So I, I think it's a really interesting question. And of course, she doesn't want to answer that question before November 3rd, but it's going to come up in the next couple of years a lot. Someone said this on the live blog, but I think, Nate, you were making the point that, like, aren't there better non-answers? Um, but maybe what that tells us is that, like, this, to Claire's point, adding justices to the court, adding adding to the number of justices on the Supreme Court is enough of a live issue on the left that, like, they don't want to go anywhere near shooting it down. I mean, Biden has said some things during the campaign to kind of shoot it down. Um, but at least now in the stretch run, they're being very, very careful about it. Yeah, if you're if everyone's going to infer that you're being evasive, um, and that you're keeping your options open, why not just say that, you know, if you do this unprecedented, blah, 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 terrible thing, then we're keeping our options open, right? Um, right now, it hasn't happened. So it's a moot point. But, you know, but we are not sure what would result if we go down that pathway because that would be a terrible, unprecedented pathway kind of thing, right? Um, because, I mean, no one, you know, no one who is worried about that is going to be reassured by her answer anyway. You know what I mean? Um, and also, I kind of think Democrats, if they get up to 53, 54 senators, very well might add justices. So the framing is more like threaten it, basically say... Well, we really don't want to, but if you're going to force us into doing it by filling Ginsburg's seat during an election, then we're going to have to consider it kind of a like, well, look what so you made me do kind of thing. The one time when the threat, so originally Democrats, some Democrats were threatening that if you fill this during the lame duck session, then we'll retaliate in this way, right? Because that would seem, the lame duck presuming Democrats win everything, right? Because that would seem kind of grossly anti-democratic. You lose an election and you do it in the lame duck, right? Um, but Republicans say, well, we're just going to fill it before the election anyway. Um, if because of, um, timing issues that doesn't wind up happening, right. Um, then maybe in the lame duck, you actually have some leverage. Um, conservatives might say we'd actually prefer five, four to seven, six (laughs) the other way or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah. Can I go back to something that's completely separate from this? I've been thinking, like Mike Pence. (laughs) I've been thinking about you know going back to that the perennial question of like what's the utility of debates, particularly like what's the utility of debates in in the Trump era, and the utility of debates, as with frankly all televised interviews or fully printed interviews, is to get the politician on record. That is the hardest thing to do to get a clear answer on the record about a position from a politician, but that is the sole utility of the presidential debate. And the reason why I'm so frustrated by tonight's debate, and frankly, like, I'm just frustrated that there is a complete inability to get anyone on the record about this stuff, particularly Trump and Pence, and that there seems to be you know, big things happen and then three weeks later we forget about them. You know, like, uh, that is the sole utility of these debates. Well, but and if that's true, and I, I think that's right, then then there really shouldn't be debates, right? Because, like, generally speaking, uh, the, a journalist is going to be a much more effective tool for getting that than the other candidate. Right. Generally speaking, I think that's true. So then it should be like 90 minutes, two hours, a live interview and and the reporter can follow up as much as they want. They could do the whole 90 minutes just trying to nail Pence down on whether he would 
you know, accept the election results, right? And then another 90 minutes for, for Harris. I mean... I do wonder if we're suffering a little bit from covering this campaign as professionals. No, 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 no. Don't, 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 like, don't undercut this. First of all, the whole point is that we're covering it as professionals and voters are watching it as voters. Like, that, that ecosystem has always existed. There have always been people mediating and thinking about it fully professionally. Like, I think that's sort of a, you know... I didn't let you finish your point before biting your head off. <laughs> <laughs> but Kamala, but the average voter might not know some of the things about Kamala Harris and Mike Pence or their president's positions um, that a journalist would. Um, Which is why the journalist is there to inform them. Yeah. So one, that's a really low bar, right? If it's just like, hey, meet the candidate and here are their positions, then actually I still would argue that that, uh, you know, probably 800 words by Claire Malone is is much more effective of at, at doing that than letting the candidates speak for themselves because they're going to lie about their records. Right. Um, now, if the point is just like, hey, get a sense for this person um, in a very would you have a beer with them? What do you make of them? Which is like actually how politics works then debates are are dandy and they serve their purpose yeah i was actually going to ask about that because i think it's fair to say that both mike pence and kamala harris want to be president or plan on running for president at some point in the future and watching the debate through that prism and thinking about how they would campaign to a national audience on their own behalf did we get of any sense of what that might look like or what kinds of successes or challenges they might have in such a situation? I mean, Kamala Harris ran a what was seen as a roundly disorganized presidential campaign that didn't have a coherent like vibe to it. And Mike Pence was a quite unsuccessful, in many ways, governor of Indiana. But like, I guess they both talk pretty. I, I, like, you know, if we're talking about actual records. Yeah. Yeah. Or even the records as as like in these moments in debates, Harris had a very good moment in the debate. She also had some not so great moments. I think overall, I mean, this is hugely subjective, but also like bared out somewhat, I think, in the in the post debate polls we did. Harris has an uneven record in, in these debates. Pence. But like he's a reliable B minus, right? Um, but but it's if, I mean he if, was pretty good at projecting calm if that was his goal. I think he benefits somewhat from from the comparison with Trump. But sure, let's yeah. give him let's Lowered give him a expectations. B. Um, but I think to your point, Galen, if I think it's I think if these are the front runners for the twenty twenty four nominations. Um, they're they're not very strong front runners. I mean, I don't think Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are that different in certain ways. They're both very calibrating, right? They're both very good at um at understanding what the right balance point is relative to the different constituencies pulling and hugging on them, and they're kind of somewhat explicit about that. Nate, your point about about Biden and and Harris being similar just in the way they approach politics, I, th- I think it's right and is and is interesting and maybe helps explain why why Biden picked pa- Harris. Th- they're also they're also similar in that they they both do have kind of uneven political skills. Um, they're really good at some things, not good at others. But I think they are very, very similar kind of on both fronts, how they approach policy and the politics of it. Well, you got to love the way political coverage works because we just entered the first uh, moments of our 2024 coverage. So uh, (laughs) thanks for that. Uh, We got three and a half weeks left in, or basically four weeks left in the current election, but already chopping up the bit. Micah, how shortly after the 2020 election do you think we'll write our first 2024 piece? Haven't we already written our first 2024 piece? Uh, we probably yeah, I think have, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Okay, so to end things... 
So to end things here, does anybody want to reveal who was the person who didn't actually watch the debate? No, no, no. Listeners and viewers have to guess. Don't reveal it. All right. Listeners, let us know. Who do you think did not watch tonight's debate? Uh, you can tweet us. This, this is, us. Wait, this is nonsensical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's... I, pr- I protest. Yeah, we should reveal. We all watched it. Okay, and here's really our final, final question. Is there going to be a debate next week? My theory is that if it has a plan at all, which probably is doubtful, then the White House's plan might be to try to bluff Joe Biden into canceling the debate because I don't think you want president to debate for purely strategic reasons, never mind the public health risk of giving Joe Biden and other people at the debate coronavirus. Um, I don't know that you want kind of Trump debating anybody um, when he hasn't had any kind of live video on him um, for a week now, right? That seems extremely risky um, between the chance that two weeks after COVID diagnosis, maybe he's had it for a bit longer, that you either have some physical or mental problems that would be very evident in a two hour long, amazingly stressful moment, right? So I think Trump is trying to bluff the commission or Biden into canceling. Um, Listeners, Nate plays so, poker. <laughs> So it's like insist on a debate that can't possibly be safe for Biden. So they have to cancel. I mean, I think I mean, look, we don't have a good script for how to talk about some of this stuff. I mean, traditionally, you know, you don't like to speculate on the on the health of the president or the candidates. Right. Um, But like, again, just statistics, statistical baselines. Right. If you have serious covid, then you may not be fully yourself. Right. Um, how much evidence does the president exhibit of that? I don't know. People can watch videos and look at the tweet storms and decide for themselves, right? But like, but these are, if we are used to talking about probabilities and stuff like that, then like, these are not 1% probabilities that Trump is on these steroids and therefore is having manic effects from it. That baseline probability is a common symptom, right? Um, so I don't know. We have to talk about things in that context. All right. Well, let's leave things there for this evening. So thank you, Nate. Thank you, Galen. Thank you, Clay. Thanks, Galen. And thank you, Micah. Thank you. And we should also mention that tomorrow, or I guess today when you're listening to this, October 8th, is the last day to order things from the 538 store in order to get them shipped by October 30th aka in time for the election so that's at 538.com slash store my name is galen druk tony chow is in the virtual control room you can get in touch by emailing us at podcast at 538.com you can also of course tweet at us with any questions or comments if you're a fan of the show leave us a rating or review in the apple podcast store or tell someone about us also make sure to subscribe to us on youtube thanks for listening and we'll see you soon